This is your second book about your years with Kennedy. What made you decide to revisit that experience? At least uh, two or three reasons. Uh, one, interestingly enough, uh, was a well-known American historian was visiting me in my office to show me a tape transcript, which I had never heard of before, from Kennedy in late 62 or early 63, in which he was musing aloud to his visitors about making me National Security Council after sending McGeorge Bundy, his national security advisor, to the White House. I had never heard of it before. That historian said to me, after I couldn't identify the tape for him, the uh, history community knows a lot about what Kennedy did for this country and for the Democrats, and we know that you had a great influence on Kennedy, but we don't know anything about you and where your ideals and ideas came from. So I decided maybe I had an obligation to history. And the world has changed a lot. The uh, Some people complained when the first book came out that $10 was quite ex outrageously expensive for a You're book right. about Kennedy. I'd forgotten that. Uh, it, it, would be, it would have been interesting if you had become the National Security Advisor because you had so many other jobs. Your official title was Special Counsel to the President. Had anybody held that title before? Oh, yes. Uh, Sam Rosenman had it for... FDR and Clark Clifford had it for Truman, and Clark Clifford was one of the transition advisors for Kennedy, and he wanted the what he called the policy program job to have the title, for old times' sake, special counsel. But was there a job description? Because you seem to have been everywhere, and you were de facto chief of staff, weren't you? Because Kennedy didn't, didn't have, have a chief, chief of staff. staff in the sense that I had power over other staff members. I didn't give orders. I think I was called uh, Chief of Staff for Policy, but that was not an official title. Was there any jealousy among the rest of the staff about your position and your access to the president? Interestingly enough, Leonard, while I didn't think so, doing research in the files at the Kennedy Library for this book, I found that there were a couple of my uh, colleagues on that White House staff who uh, were not among my warmest admirers. And why do you think that is? Because they were jealous or because Who knows? perhaps they disagree with you? To begin with, I wasn't uh, Irish Catholic from Boston. A second reason is that as a young man, very many years earlier, I had registered as a conscientious objector for non-combatant service, and I don't think they approved of that. Mm-hmm also probably uh, felt that it might come back to haunt the president. But you... It never the, did. It came back to haunt me a couple of times. Why? Uh, oh, because Barry Goldwater uh, attacked the president on the floor of the Senate by attacking me. And many years later, when Jimmy Carter nominated me to be director of Central Intelligence, big mistake on his part, uh, the fact that uh, I wasn't willing to kill people was uh, used against me. Apparently, the director of CIA is supposed to kill people. I didn't know that before. You complain that the first line in your New York Times obit will be uh, Ted Sorensen, JFK speechwriter. Why is that so shabby? It's not, and uh, uh, you don't mind if I chide you a little bit. You didn't read the next line in the book in which I said I decided that's not so shabby yeah. because there are something like 20 Kennedy speeches which I've seen listed in those list of the 100 greatest speeches of the 20th century, that sort of thing. So no, it's not shabby at all. JFK did a lot through his speeches. How were those speeches developed? Uh, did uh, often what we hear is a president uh, sits down with the speechwriters and says, "This is uh, these are the general themes I want covered," and then comes back and does a little editing or perhaps just reads the speech verbatim. JFK never read a speech verbatim in his life that he had not previously reviewed and revised. So, uh, first of all, he didn't sit down with his speechwriters. For one reason or another, we didn't have a speechwriting department as modern White Houses do. 
I was the speech writing department in addition to being counsel and domestic policy advisor and as you point out a, a few other hats. I mentioned in the book that uh, I didn't have to spit, submit my speech drafts to the senior White House uh, aide. I was the senior White House aide. Was that the way it had been previously? FDR and, uh, no, and Eisenhower uh, and Truman? Uh, I'm not familiar with uh, the situation under Truman except I gather that Clark Clifford as special counsel had a major role. I know that uh, Congressman, former Congressman Ken Heckler, who last I heard is still alive, uh, did some speech writing under Truman. But uh, the speech writing department of six, seven, ten people is really a phenomenon that began under, under the last several presidents.